Well, I would wish you'd pray with me for a friend of mine named Jerry. Jerry uh, and I met many, many years ago as a business partner. Let me know Jerry was Jewish, had a three-year-old child that died tragically and uh, didn't want anything to do with a God that would let his three-year-old child die. A couple years later, he showed a little interest. His business partner, who was a Christian and a deacon in a big church in Cary, invited me to one breakfast so that I might answer some of Jerry's questions. Six years later, meeting every week at Wednesday for breakfast, that one breakfast had become multiple breakfasts, and we finally got to a point where Jerry accepted Christ, got involved in a Bible study that I was leading, and uh, we, we missed out on seeing him for a while. He started going to something different. But on my drive over here today, I got an urgent email from Jerry, who said he was going to reconnect with my Thursday morning men's group. We've been missing him for about a month said, I have a rather unexpectedly uh, expected surgery tomorrow, open heart surgery at Wake Med in, in Raleigh. He didn't say how many blockages or what the symptoms were, but he said, pray for me. And I extended response saying the great physician will attend you. But I said, I would also have our men's group begin the, the session praying for Jerry Radman. Jerry is just a, a great example of how the unsavable get saved. And, uh, and still are tracking for the Lord. So join with me as we pray for the, not only Jerry, but for our time. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. And immediately we're aware that you are here in our presence. You have manifest yourself in a supernatural way already as we feasted together. But now as we gather around the word of God, we want to hear you speak the things concerning yourself. So we thank you in advance for what you'll do there. We lift up to you, Jerry, and we thank you that tomorrow the great physician will be very present in the OR. That poor surgeon will do the surgery the best he's ever done and not take any credit for it. As your hands guide his hands, as your thoughts guide his thoughts, they all the attending staff and the medicine and anesthesiologists will just work in concert with what you're doing. And just write another page in Jerry's uh, fresh book his book of testimony, how well you have treated him. Pray for his wife and his family that they would be comforted. And about this time tomorrow, we'd hear good news of a great surgery and the supernatural work of healing that you've begun. We thank you for that in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to have multiple sharings on the screen here. Hopefully that this will work and uh, we'll make sense of it in a second. I want to begin by asking you to think back over your entire life, ever since you've been uh, able to go to any kind of party and reminisce and ask and answer the question, what's the best party and or celebration you have ever been to? Think about that. Now, some of you have uh, married off daughters. And you've had that great thrill and responsibility and financial liability to provide all the festivities, otherwise culminating in a reception. I asked this question to a group the other day, and a man sitting up here on the front left said, oh, it was my daughter's reception. We had a Caribbean wedding. We had this beautiful reception in this resort. He says, it took me three years to pay for it. That might be your experience, the, the festivities, the joy, the people, the food, the drink, all that just makes for a great time. Some of you may think of uh, a celebration of longevity, like an anniversary or a uh, retirement of someone. I gave my wife a surprise retirement party when she finished 42 years of cardiac thoracic, cardiothoracic nursing and uh, told her, we're just going out to dinner to the restaurant, but I'd conspired and we had about 40 of her former workers all there in this restaurant. We turned the corner into the banquet room and there they all yelled surprise. Unfortunately, the banner that my kids had hung for me with her name and celebration, reverberation of the celebration knocked the plastic off and the banner fell at that particular moment. I don't know what your greatest experience is. Some of my great memories of celebration weren't really at a wedding or And I'm standing around 20,000 perfectly unknown strangers, but we're thrusting our fist in the air, yelling, hoorah. I want you to keep that picture in mind, because we're about to look at the greatest party 
that has already begun and is uh, one that you and I will frequent in, in some period of time. I don't, I don't hope anytime soon, but it's found in a section of scripture that will rival some of these great parties and scenes. I wish I could say these are some of the pictures of receptions that I officiated at, but these are just, I look for pictures of the most expensive ones, and these certainly fit that bill. And they really do represent joy, food, just a lot of enjoyment to the point of great memories. But Jesus is going to talk about it in Luke chapter 14. Won't read the earlier parts of 14 where he's at a feast. He's with the Pharisees at one of their houses on the Sabbath. And he begins, begins to talk about dinners and invitations, things like if you ever get invited to go to a, a big wedding, don't take the best seat, take the, the worst seat, and hopefully someone will uh, upgrade you. He says, that if you give a party, uh, don't just invite people who can reciprocate, who can pay you back. Invite those that uh, can't do that. That'll be a gracious gift for them. And after he finished that, one of those who were reclined at the table with him heard these things. And he said to Jesus, blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. Now we've moved from earth to heaven. So Jesus saw a great teachable moment. And this is what we're going to focus on today. He said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and he invited, it just says many. If you ever had the occasion to do the, the invitation thing for a wedding or any kind of other festivity, and you know, you have finite ability to seat them or pay for the meals. Many is a lot, but it reaches a point of, uh, of a certain uh, last person. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his service to say to those who had been invited, let me stop for a moment to explain first century protocol. You would Today, we would tell someone, uh, here's the date of the wedding. Save the date, right? They didn't do that in his day. They basically said, you are invited, and when that date is getting closer, we'll let you know. Can't even save the date. We have to wait for all the preparations to be finished, and then we'll put an all call out, and you'll come. Come for it. everything is now ready. So people began to come, but they are all alike. They all alike began to make excuses. You know what an excuse is, don't you? A man clarified that for me many years ago. He said, an excuse is the skin of a reason stuck with a lie. A reason is a good thing to be excused for, but not an excuse. And the three different ones here, look at them. We'll analyze them in just a moment. The first one said to him, I bought a field. This would be an agricultural advancement. This is something un, not uncommon in that day. But what he said next is confusing. And I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. So he explained a little bit further the reason he wouldn't attend. And another said, I've bought, again, work-related, five yoke of oxen. I'm assuming that's two oxen per yoke, so 10 oxen. And he doesn't say, I must go. He just says, I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Now, they're nice enough to just say, please. But you're already seeing through the excuses, aren't you? I like number three. This is like self-explanatory. I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. What do you think's behind that? Well, in Jewish tradition, from the, the day you get married for a year, you had all kinds of excuses. You didn't have to serve in the military. You didn't have to do a lot of other things civil servants did. They reserved that first year for you to enjoy getting to know your wife and vice versa. But he, didn't even, he doesn't even say, please excuse me. He says it should be self-explanatory. I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So look at the reaction. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became, my translation says, angry. And he said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city. Oh, here we go. Of the city. That's nearby where the banquet is to be held. Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. 
Well, they're way ahead of him. The servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there's room. And the master said to the servant, invitation number three now, go out to the highways and the hedges. That's not in the city, is it? That's out beyond the city limits. The highways and hedges and compel people to come in. And here's the great reason that my house, the master's house, will be 50% completely full. No, 75%, 80%. No, that my house may be filled. And these last words are terrible. For I tell you, none of those men who were initially invited, who gave excuses, they shall taste the banquet. They don't get the first hors d'oeuvre. They don't get the first sip of champagne. They don't get any taste at all. So what we're going to do in the next few moments is look at this passage in four ways. We're going to look at the banquet itself. Then we'll look at these invitations. There's a series of three. Then we'll look at the excuses. And finally, the exclusions from the banquet. Look at them with me. Look at the banquet. Already you can see this guy, this parable is in response to the man talking about eating the bread in the kingdom of God. We're talking about heaven. We're talking about the greatest banquet that is already ongoing and will be ongoing when you and I get there and there'll still be seats at the table. In Luke 22, when Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples, he made reference to this when he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, before the cross. For I tell you that I will not eat it until it is fulfilled where? In the kingdom, in the kingdom of God. And then he said a little bit later in Luke 22, when he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. I think we have it on good authority that heaven's a little bit different than this guy's idea. I've talked to people, they said, heaven sounds terribly boring. We're just going to sit around in a cloud. Maybe if we can stroke a harp and we're good enough, we can be that guy. Then I saw this cartoon. Boy, I wish I'd brought a magazine, you know. Just boring life in there. No, 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 no. Heaven, there's going to be laughter. There's so many references, Old and New Testament, of laughter. He who sits in heavens laughs, Psalm 2. The Lord laughs, Psalm 37. But you, O oh Lord, laugh at them. Just right now, if you could stick a microphone in heaven, that's one of the sounds you would hear. The laughter of the people, the joy, you'd hear God laughing and celebrating. I think it also means here God's laughing at humans on the earth that think they've got it all figured out or that they've got it working. Someone has often said, you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans, right? So just imagine that's the background noise of heaven, even as we sit here today. But uh, there's, there's just this incredible celebration that's foretold in scripture. Luke 6, blessed are you who weep now, but you shall laugh. Rejoice in that day and here we're talking about leaping. Leap for joy. My body doesn't leap anymore, right, currently. It don't walk so good anymore. Getting up out of the bed in the morning is an event. But one day, you're going to see what's already going on there. There's an Olympics of great celestial proportion. There's a lot of leaping going on. How high can you leap? Maybe we'll just get up there and see who can jump higher later when we can leap for joy. Your reward is great in heaven. I like what Tony Warringer, Warner wrote in a book. He listed some of the things that he expects to see in heaven. He says, there's going to be drinking in heaven. I don't know what your current stance on drinking is. Fruit of the vine, that could be Welch's or that could be wine. I don't know which way you go, but there's going to be some celebrating with drinking in heaven. There's going to be music. There will be dancing. Sounds like a party to me. There will be friendship. There will be passion and worship. There'll be a lot of people, and I love number seven, there's going to be a reunion of epic proportions. I know who I want to see. You got some people that have gone on ahead, mom and dad, maybe family otherwise, friends. There's a lot of backslapping going on in heaven and a lot of catching up. My uh, parents both died five years ago within six weeks, six weeks of each other, and they were in horrible condition the last two, three years of their life. I am looking forward to seeing them leaping, 
laughing, running around like newlyweds. I mean, just, I can't wait to see it. Heaven is by all measure a party. And I don't know what party you were thinking about earlier, but this is going to eclipse that. And maybe you've heard of parties that were great and fabulous and you were never invited. Guess what? You're invited to this one. Look at the invitation. You know it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, whosoever believes in him. How many people does that mean? Whosoever. Many. They should not perish, but they're going to have eternal life, and that's going to be the beginning of the party. So it doesn't make any sense to me that anybody would excuse themselves from this. But before we're too hard on the three that are listed in Scripture, take a look at some of the excuses that you and I make sometimes that allows us to disengage from the party. The first one said to him, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Now, wait a minute. PH or anybody else here that's bought real estate, bought a lot to build, did you buy it and then go look at it? Did you not do your due diligence beforehand to go look at it, survey it, sometimes do things like see if it perks, see if it can be buildable, how is it zoned? Don't you do all that before you buy it? What is this guy doing? Did he have a proxy go out and buy it for him? And they said, okay, after you buy it, I'll go look at it. Either this guy is stupid in his business ways, or he's he's just de not, not deliberate in doing it, or this is just what it is, an excuse. By the way, when do you expect the banquet to start in this, this parable? It's going to start in the morning, the afternoon, or mostly at night. Let's just agree it'd be nighttime. That's when most of the good banquets take place. How are you going to do checking out your land in the dark? I mean, I don't get this guy. What he's basically saying, I'm comparing your opportunity with my desire to not be in your opportunity. I'm just too busy. And now we got to back up and say, that can be me. I can uh, make a lot of various flimsy uh, skin of a reason stuff with a lot of excuses just to say, I, I, I'm busier over here. Number two, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go. He didn't even say I must go. He just says I go. I just choose to go examine them. Once again, unless you're going to do it by candlelight, it's not a good time to inspect 10 oxen in the dark. He should have looked at them before he bought them. These are pretty bad excuses. He just said I'm too busy. And this third guy, I'm going to throw my wife under the bus here. I would love to be at your party. Don't you know me? I'm a party animal, but my wife, oh. what wife wouldn't love to get dressed up and go to a banquet? I mean, my wife is always jealous when I go preach at a, a wedding and then I stay for the reception for a while and she's not really supposedly there invited. I tell her, come on anyway, You're, we're, we're a match set. So come on. They, they love dressing up. They love engaging. My wife's a little bit of an introvert, so she's not fully into meeting strange people, but there's always someone you can find. This is one of the more bogus excuses there. He doesn't even say, please excuse me. He just says, I can't go. Go ask your wife later. Uh, if I got invited to a fancy banquet, would you go? You'll find out this is a flimsy excuse, too busy. But the amazing thing in this whole story to me is how God wanted to fill up the room. Every now and then you'll hear somebody say, Christianity is so narrow and so exclusive and so restrictive. Uh, God is just picking and choosing who he wants to be there. This tells me otherwise. He wants a full party. He wants the room full. So much so that he invites others. The second round of invitations, he says, in his anger. I, I don't want us to minimize that. It's it bothers God when people say no to his invitation or whatever excuse they offer. He said, well, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Not your likely guest at a party. That was breaking social protocol of the day. But I want my banquet table full. 
Well, the, the slave says, we've done that already. So he says, well, then invitation number three, go further than that. Let's make sure we can fill it up. Let's go all the way out of town. Let's go to the highways and the hedges and compel people. By the way, it's not part of the message today, but who are the servants in this story? You and me. And one of our jobs is to compel people to get to the party. Compel people to come in that my house finally may be filled. What a beautiful invitation. I'm going to tell you briefly the story you may have heard of a, a young lady by the name of Sarah Cummings. This is back in, in July of 2017, so seven years ago. She was within one week of celebrating her marriage. Uh, they had already committed to all the expenses of the reception. One week from I do and her husband backs out, her husband to be. In all the articles I've read about this, there's never any reason given. He, the, the groom's mother had died recently. Some think that might've been the reason, but he left her high and dry. And guess what? They had a $30,000 wedding reception that was canceled, but it was non-refundable. This was in uh, Carmel, Indiana, near Indianapolis at the Ritz Charles. They had reservations in space and food for 170 guests. What do you think she did? You're way ahead of me. Yeah. She had worked and volunteered in the greater Indianapolis area in uh, homeless shelters. And because the money would have to be spent, and to his credit, the, the, the wannabe husband who doesn't want to be anymore chipped in to help with this and help pay off the 30000 along with other people. Once they heard what was going to happen, she didn't have to pay all 30000 herself. They sent buses to homeless shelters. The week before, businesses that had clothing donated formal dress wear for ladies and jackets for men. And she said, well, if the party's going to happen, I want it full. And if it'll work for me, I'm going to try to show you guys just a little ancient video from it. Uh, let me try. There is a great little video here. If I can pull it up, it'll take a second. It's actually the as the people start arriving at this party. Now, you, of course, it's not going to work. If it doesn't work, that's okay. I can just finish the rest of the story. But I, I really want you to hear the people and their responses. <laughs> now they want to sell me something. Here we go. I think we're getting close. We might have to endure all the ads, like a 30-second ad. But uh, I, I've never heard of such a, a switch as this to the glory of God. And you'll actually hear a gentleman who attended who made a comparison to what they were seeing to the verses we're looking at today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this at risk because it's an ad. Good for employees, good for Fall River. <gasps> Hopefully good you'll spot. be able to see some of this. was an opportunity to let these people know that they deserve to be here just as much as anybody else does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you look beautiful. Thank you so much for coming in. It's a great opportunity to kind of spread love on a day where love was meant to be spread um, with all of us. <laughs> I mean, this is like Thanksgiving dinner 2.0 for these guys. Um, this is definitely a blessing for each and every one of them, and they're excited to be here. Uh, many of them have not had a meal like this in years, or maybe not even in their lifetime. So I, I know it's a, it's a great opportunity for them. Today means togetherness and love. Uh, it's a seed that you plant that grows. It's kind of 
contagious, you know, being it forward and it's just love. Today I was thinking in the Bible it says that the uh, the master planned this party and he sent them out his servant to go get the people to come in and they didn't want to come so he said go get the people on the byways and, then, and have them come in and share the supper and I think that and that's what hit my head she could have done anything but she went in and asked those that are on the byways and the highways to come in so that's a blessing you know. turn your situation around, no matter what it is, no matter how bad it is. And so that's inspiration for everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. I, uh, I can't imagine what it, what it took in their abilities to appreciate that. Um, and what they talked about for years, some of them not having a meal or having clothes like they had. That's the banquet and how anybody can find in their heart excuses from that. I'll never know. So here again, some of the pictures of that event, just amazing reaction all because she wanted 170 places filled. Our heavenly father, thank goodness has a bigger banquet table than that. How many millions or billions are already there and we will join them soon. There are, unfortunately, in this story, the exclusions. The bouncers at the door. Jesus reports that I, I tell you, none of those men who made excuses, who were invited in the first wave, shall get a taste of the banquet. I've used this sometimes in sharing Christ with people and say, you know, you may not have had much in this life, but if you find Jesus, if he finds you, if you accept his gift, you'll have a taste of heaven and more. Wouldn't you like to have just a taste? And some people will say yes on that basis. So I just return us to the invitation as we close out. God did love the world to the extent that he, he bought up the banquet seats. He gave his only son. And then extends the invitation to whoever believes in him, not going to miss the banquet, not going to perish, but going to have eternal life. And I know you can't read that invitation over there on the left, but here's what it says to conclude our time. A perfect invitation for us today and for our friends. You are invited to come dine with me from now until eternity. Believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and dine with Jesus as your host. To live in heaven eternally, all you must do is RSVP. Respond to the invitation. Lord, thank you for the parable that is real. Thank you for the reality of heaven being a party. These meager descriptions in the parable don't do it justice. But we can anticipate great joy and laughter and dancing and singing, celebrating around the throne and shouting, worthy is the lamb who is slain. Oh, get us a little bit giddy for that time, but use us on this side of the party to get others to come, to compel them to come in. Don't let us be selfish in receiving our invitation. Let us extend it to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you think about heaven as a party? Has that always been your understanding or did you see it as a more solemn, boring worship service as one lady described it to me recently? What are your thoughts? I'm just going to say that I'm reading this book called Imagine Heaven. It's written by a guy who was a non-believer and an engineer and then his father had a near-death experience and piqued his interest in he started looking at other ones, and he became not just a Christian, but he went on to become a pastor, and he studied. He dismissed a lot of them that said, these people just look like they wanted to write a book and make money. And so what he's done is he's, he's pulled together what's common about them 
among people who have incredible credibility and uh, he's shown what they've seen is uh, is also shown in scripture and how it how it pairs up and it's the most exciting thing you can possibly read it's the mo- it's so exciting because it talks about the glory of god is what we're going to be exposed to the second in all of, all of these cases the second you die you're free of pain you're in peace you're you're in you have a body it's light it's it's yes it's extra biblical but it's it's based on what god has told us it's the most exciting thing you can read i can't put it down it, it's very very exciting and it's going to be a party beyond what we can imagine so what your topic is is exactly what we be, should be excited about and uh yes god wanted to save all the jews but we know that the the chief scribes and and uh leaders and the pharisees they rejected him and uh so he says if you have not the son you have not the so turn down the invitation yeah and then he and he he spoke the the first thing jesus i can remember he's talking to the lady at the well that the jews wouldn't even go into samaria he goes over there sits down and says give me a drink and uh she's like why are you talking to me so he's out in the shrubs and the bushes and and uh, telling her that he's got a water that she will she'll never thirst from again and um i'm telling you you, you got to read this book it's so exciting it's just exciting to think about we 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 don't know how to even open our minds to how great god is really exciting now this is a party though this is a party <laughs> We're partying. Heaven is better than Thursday men's Bible study. I'll just t- t- It's a step up. In this parable, there's there's two calls, and I kind of equate them to, uh, you know, God gives a general call to everybody. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever will. Uh, so that's, that's a, like a general call of God. And uh, the... The Jews that, G- that Jesus was addressing, the l- religious leaders and Pharisees had had, you know, I, I think they would say maybe loosely, but they had kind of answered that call. But the second call of God is an effectual call, and it's a call to His Son Jesus Christ. And 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 the Jews were absolutely rejecting Jesus as 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 the Son of God. And so the Jews rejected that second call. And I think there's a lot of that correlation in this parable here. And, uh, you know, and there's a lot of people out there that think that they, they sort of have this mental thing that they're saved. They've had, they, they like the idea of that general call, but they never received the call to have a, a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and, and that, that's the call. And, and you, the parable tells you the, the ones that were called, but didn't come. They're not going to get to taste the, the, the beauty of the the uh, feast in heaven, the, the banquet in heaven. They're not going to get a, even a little taste of it. I guess one way to ask the question would be, what are you looking most forward to? What are you looking forward to the most when you get to heaven? Come on, you party animals. I know you got some. Okay, I'll say something. There's Coach. Go ahead, Coach. Uh, this is no comparison uh, in terms of size and stuff like that, but I just want to tell you guys right now, sitting here on a Zoom is not like being with y'all. Uh, you don't have the same. You don't get to put your arm and hug somebody or shake somebody's hand. Uh, you see them from a distance, and and uh, there's a there's a lot of difference. Uh, I know I love Friday morning Bible study. I love this Bible study because of getting to see the people. So uh, if you don't get to go to the party, you're not going to get to see the people. Well said. Without a doubt to me, I don't even have to think about that, your, your question. I think I said it to you uh, yesterday or something too. Um, 
without a doubt, the most incredible part of, of being at the banquet of the Lamb is beholding Jesus' face. Do I walk up to him and just look him eye to eye and him look at you, and then to have him put his arms around you and embrace you? That's that's what I'm looking forward to most of all. Well, and, and there's a certain posture that's mentioned in Scripture when beholding Jesus that actually occurred. Uh, we studied it this week in our Bible study in Mark chapter 5. Every time you see someone get a miracle or an exorcism from Jesus in chapter 5, it all starts at the feet of Jesus. The madman of Gadara, possessed by a legion of demons, throws himself at Jesus' feet. When Jesus gets to the other side of the water, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, has a 12-year-old near death. He throws himself at Jesus' feet. Then in the crowd, there's a woman with an issue of blood. She comes up and touches the hem of his garment. And when Jesus calls out who did it, she throws herself at Jesus' feet. And you and I physically can't do that. We will one day in heaven, but we can assume a posture of worship and and understanding in, in just our physical ability. We are below him. He's above us. And I think a lot of heaven, you know, with new bodies, we'll be able to kneel a lot more. We'll be able to reach down and touch his feet and say, worthy is the lamb that's slain. I wonder if the wounds are still visible on his feet, on his in his hands. Joe? I was uh, listening to some tapes, by, I think it was from David Jeremiah many years ago, and uh, he described how large heaven is. He had some way to measure heaven. My question is, how large is this banquet hall? It's got to be a big, big banquet hall for all of us. Or we're going to have a series of these. Is it going to be just one for everybody? Or are we going to have multiple ones every other week? Going to, everybody going to be invited? What's, what do you think? How you how you visualize that? Well, I, I my stock answer is the title of the award-winning Dove song, I Can Only Imagine. And uh, I tried to find the picture you may have noticed in the PowerPoint that just goes on and on endlessly. And I don't know. I don't know if it's actually in those dimensions. I mean, we're probably in a fourth or fifth dimension when we get to heaven. But I will relay the story I've used here before that a guy wanted one time to see heaven and hell before he died and choose which one to go to. So he asked God if he can do that. And God, for whatever reason, said, sure. Where do you want to go first? So they took him down to hell, and it was a banquet table, just as long as you could see the greatest food you can imagine, everything we've been alluding to that heaven will have. The only weird thing about it was the utensils. The forks were four feet long. So you stab that piece of meat on your plate, and you can't hardly negotiate it to your mouth. It falls all over you, and the guy gets it. Hell is being close, but no cigar. It's eternal frustration. You almost got it. So he says, okay, let's go look at heaven. So now he gets transported up to heaven to take a look, and to his shock, the banquet table is exactly the same. People on the other sides with four-foot-long forks. And then they start to eat, and he sees the difference. Now the people aren't eating for themselves. They're feeding the person across the table. The kind of people that go to hell are selfish. The kind of people that go to heaven are selfless. That's my best image, Joe. I can't go any good further. Story. I've heard that. It's a good story. I think it's an all-you-can-eat, though. I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and no calories. I like that deal, too. I know. I, I, why do we, we do, we always associate a good party with good food, right? Why should we even assume it would be worse than that when we get to heaven? Mr. Gene. So I'm going to use this. Um, think of this as a symbol for a lot of things earthly. I believe when we get to heaven, there will not be an April 15th. <laughs> You speak for a lot of people right there, Gene. I, I, I'm voting for a lot of things. I don't know if they'll be real, but um, some of the things Jesus did in the resurrected body for 40 days after the resurrection, before he ascended, I, I'm hoping we get some of that. Some of those things that defy physics, like going through walls, 
And he did, he did eat. Remember he was offered fish and he ate it and it was a physical body. So if and it wasn't like a spiritual body, some people assume Jesus had, because that fish would have just fallen out like Casper, the friendly ghost, you know, uh, and he ate well, he ate fish. So I'm hoping he, Jesus is more than a pescatarian when we get to heaven, but there's so many indications of that body being able to do supernatural things that we can't do currently. But, uh, I hope you've all accepted the invitation. Sadly, we know people who have not, and that may be the big takeaway today. Compel, compel. Any other questions or comments on heaven? You got all figured out? All right, let's take a moment to pray. Lord, thank you for the invitation. As undeserving as all of us are, you still look at us and you want your room full. And that includes the likes of us and all of our friends and family. For those who've said yes to the invitation and already RSVP, we look forward to the day when we fall at your feet and lovingly worship you, enjoy each other's company and celebration around the banquet. For those who don't, Lord, it's our opportunity to compel them to come in. Give us both the visual and the verbal witness we need to make heaven so attractive, the smells and the taste so good that somebody in our life will find and follow Jesus to that great banquet table. Give us the opportunities and the words and the spirit to do so. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.